I wasn't a bad guy. It's very difficult to be 24, 25, running strip clubs, making a load of money. It was like being a, a movie star, being a football player. Hey guys, it's Matt Haycock. Matt Haycock's here. Hey guys. Here. You opened 11. I had 11 strip clubs. I'd been learning how to borrow money, but we were completely over leveraged, literally within the space of about two months, and I'd been made personally bankrupt. I've been told by most people that, you know, well, that was it, I was finished. I don't have a, a motivating story to tell about how I went from bankrupt to not feeling suicidal to going and making money again. But I woke up the next day and I needed to put some food on the table, and you know, I had two choices. I can sit at home and talk about how the world's against me and Ooh, this should never have happened. And that's not going to get me paid and really that's what got me back in the game whatever you want to achieve with a plan with consistency and with volume you just can't fail to be successful I love our listeners and viewers to hear about your story and then we can come to your lessons your challenges the stuff you share the businesses and I want you to inspire uh, the gladiators following us, if you don't mind. So tell us a little bit about your story. I know it's amazing. Well, you know, every time I, I, I tell the story, I always think, I've told this story so many times, I must find a way to say it quicker uh, because I've kind of got 25 years of story to talk about now, but I can never seem to get any quicker, but I'll condense it take as quick time. as I can. Take your time. And then uh, then you can pick the bits that you want to you wanna dig deep on. But look, long story short, uh, I'm 42 years old now and I've always wanted to be in business. So from eight years old, nine years old, as long as I can remember, I um, I wanted to be a business owner. Not I liked business. I'd, I'd read business books, uh, and I said books because you know, thirty years ago, there's no inter Instagram, there's no internet, there's no podcast. You know, the only information you're getting is from books. And I remember reading you know the Donald Trump biography, the Alan Sugar biography. But and the real reason I wanted to be in business was just because I wanted to make money. And you know, you go back thirty plus years. It was very much the perception that the only way to make big money was to own your own business. My dad had his own business as well, so you know for, for sure that kind of uh, I guess entre entrepreneurial um, spirit would have rubbed, DNA, you know, yeah, would have rubbed off on me. Uh, but he was absolutely not pushing business business to me. In fact, the exact opposite. Both of my parents were very pro education, particularly my mum, uh, and I think as well that's because you know in the late eighties, early nineties, it was very much a time that if you didn't have a university degree you were kind of thought of as a failure certainly if, if you'd come from a if you'd come from a good family if you if you, if you had uh, you know been to private education and then not gone to university it was always like why have I put you in all that investment 10 years I mean, of private yeah. education to not go to university so I, I I really have my parents hammering on about uni but I spent my teenage years trying to uh, you know to start any business I could I'd buy, I mean, I know you're, you're from England too. Uh, we used to have a magazine there called The Exchange and Mart. I don't know if you remember Oh, yeah, that. I remember, remember it, yeah, that, absolutely. Which was kind of... 90... Is that still going? No, I don't think so. But I mean, back then... It yeah. changed hands a few times, didn't oh, really? it? Some, but, yeah. I mean, it was, yeah, for anyone who doesn't know it, it's like 98% buying and selling crap. It's like, yeah. I guess it was like a, a printed version of eBay back in the kind of 80s and 90s. But they always had a few pages of business opportunities. And I mean, by business opportunities, they were basically, you know, some kind of pond scheme that um, you know, that someone was peddling through the post but as a you know as a hungry slash desperate 14 15 year old you know I'd, I'd be buying everything reading everything you know sending off my stamped addressed envelope to, uh, to, to to try and get some information I'd be buying products and selling it at the market I, I you know I, I was trying to buy domain names in you know in the kind of mid 90s to, to sit on those and, and flip them Obviously, you know, not, not, nothing, nothing really worked for me. Um, and I finished school at 18, wanted to avoid going to university. Like I said, my parents were desperate for me to go. Uh, but I convinced them to let me take a gap year, take a year off, uh, and I would go and try and do some work. And I said, look, if everything fails during this gap year, uh, then I'll go back to university or I'll go and start a university. And I ended up working in a family corporate clothing business, and that was that was my first, let's say, proper business. Whereabouts in England? Was in it? Leeds. Uh, okay. Yeah, I was yeah. born in Leeds, cool. raised always from there. And um, so this this was a business that my dad had invested in. It was a thirty plus year old business which had been through some restructuring. And in theory, my dad was supposed to um, just take a passive investment, and the the existing management team would carry on to run it. I went in there to work in sales. 
And, you know, I'd, I'd be coming home from work every day, you know, banging my hands on the table, saying, Dad, you know, they're, they're running this business into the ground, you know, they're, they're taking the piss, they're robbing you, they're doing this, they're doing the other. And my dad kind of used to say, I agree, I can see it, but I just I kind of can't be bothered because he just sold his business at the time. And he was like, look, I've had 25 years of stress from business. I've had 30 years, of your, 30 years of your mother. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't need this. And one day he kind of gave me and said, you know what, you go and do what you want with it because you can't do it any worse than, than, than everybody else so has done. he had done. controlling shares. He could have... He, yeah, he did. He did. But he did by that point. And when he started, he didn't. He had probably had ten or twenty percent, and then it needed more money and more money. So it got to the point where 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 he had control. This is retail stores. No, it? it was uh, it was making corporate clothing, making uniforms wow, for amazing. security guards, okay. bus drivers. That, like you know, a very. Um, uh, it was just like I said, it was an accidental passive investment for him. It was not yes. something that any of us had any any prior knowledge of. So I went in this next day and basically fired everybody. And we started the business from scratch because there kind of was no business. You know, the customers we had were dwindling and didn't want to deal with us. The banks didn't want to fund us. The suppliers didn't want to supply us. The staff were unhappy, miserable culture, everything. Uh, uh, everything was wrong. So we, st we started from scratch. And over the next three years, uh, I guess I, I learned... I learned everything a kind of an 18 19 year old who was in business could want you know could want to learn could you know could try and learn I mean I always used to say I learned everything there was to learn but then you know I moved on to my next business afterwards and fa found out that uh, you know I, 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 I still got a lot to learn and I still find that every day today but I took that business over the next three years from losing about three hundred thousand pounds a year to uh, to making about thirty grand. And I always say it wasn't it wasn't big money, but it was the the, con Shift. the concept of you know f from the big loss to the small profit and everything I learned you know, in, in that journey. Never went back to university. I never went back to university. I, I still say to this day that I'm keeping my fingers crossed that you know I can still still stay in business, so I don't have to join as a mature student in uh, <laughs> in September. But yeah, no, but you'll go in your yacht. Exactly, yeah. but, it, but it, it's funny though because we go off on a slight tangent. But you know, no, absolutely never went back to university, nor could I think of anything worse. But the older I get, the more obsessed with learning and education I do get, uh, and I don't look back and ever regret not going to university. But I, th I think I've probably been an accidental learner during my earlier years. I mean, now I'm a very, you know, very. <laughs> active learner insofar as uh, you know I will You're wake seeking up. all the yeah time. always yeah. seeking waking up you know wanting to learn this wanting to whether it's to take knowledge from another person mm -hmm. whether it's to read a book to take a course to listen to a podcast back in my 20s you know I'd, I'd learn but I probably because I'd be humble enough to know I had something to learn but I never had that that mentality to go and seek it seek it you know I, I guess I probably still did you have you came across it and you played with it but you weren't constantly looking yeah exactly yes. and I think as, as humble as I was on one side I was probably also arrogant on the other to think that oh well I don't need to go to university I think arrogance I think it's more like adrenaline you know I don't think you and I were ever, we've always been humble I like to think when I did I have when I had it when I was young was I hum, humble I was always humble polite I don't think I was ever arrogant but I think Maybe you think you're invincible. Yeah, you I mean, when I say arrogance, I don't mean, let's say, my personality towards other people, uh -huh. but but that 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 mental arrogance. Need of, to learn, need to grow, me. Yeah, and I think also, you know, because as business owners or anyone who was interested in business, there'd always be that, um, let's say, preconception that people say, "Oh, you know, you don't need to go to don't need to go to university to be in business." You know, I'm 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 from the University of Life, or you know, mm. I'm from the real world school, which. You know, is true to a degree and ha has it has its place. Uh, but I think you know you can you can learn something from any from any situation in life. I mean, you know, like we we are, you know we're talking on this podcast. You know, we were saying just before we started recording that you know I've got my podcast too, and I always say that for me. You know, even if no one ever listened to my podcast, I kind of don't care because it's a chance for me to sit down and sure. pick the brains of you know of of great people. Mm -hmm. I think yeah, for for me for me that that's that's what learning is. But you know, I think when when you're when you're younger, and particularly in that in the kind of you know, eighties and nineties, it was just very much a uh, a belief that university wouldn't add any any value to yeah. business. And also, they decide what they're going to teach you. Absolutely, when you're learning, you pick and choose what you want to learn, right? So um, so kind of going back to the story. Please, please, I'm going to keep interrupting you. For that. No, 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 really don't, don't don't worry. So um. For, 
After three years, I left that business. 30,000. 300 loss to 30K profit. Exactly. Left that business and um, my, my, my dad came back in. I think I was bored. I was kind of bored. I don't mean I'd done all I could do, but I think I, I was starting to learn what I did and didn't like. And long-term management was not really my interest or my skill set at all. You know, I like the the kind of cut and thrust of of coming up, of coming up with an idea of of being entrepreneurial, of fixing a problem, of solving something. So it was time for me to go. And my dad's skill set was very different to mine. He's mm-hmm. a lot more a lot more disciplined, a lot more structured. Uh, the business the business at the level it was at then would have would have done better with him than me. I then went on to go and work in leisure. Uh, you know, I, as a kid, I always wanted to own bars and clubs. Not because I knew anything about them, but I think you know, as as a young guy, you always think, well, look at you know, look at that bar taking all that money with all those people. If I own it, you know, all that money is mine. Meet the girls, I get to meet the girls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get to drink, drink the drink the beer, make the girls, and make the money. You know, what yes. what what better business model can there be? So I started in leisure. Had a couple of pubs that were not very successful. Uh, they weren't Leeds. terrible. Leeds in always Leeds, in. always in the Leeds area. Uh, they weren't they weren't very good. And I knew I needed some, I guess, some other income, some you know, some other kind of product within my bars to be able to make money. Uh, in my personal life, I used to spend all of my time in the local strip clubs. Uh, and I thought that because I've spent so much time there as a customer, that's... Uh, that, that, that's yes. The money you save is your profit. Well, A, the yeah. money I save is your profit, but also the, that, that's kind of taught me their business model and I can go and lift that business model. <laughs> and uh, It's like a gambler, they know how to run casinos, <laughs> Exactly. Right? So I left. So, so I um, I poached the manager from the uh, from the strip club yeah. that I was going to. Took you must have been like in your early twenties still. Yeah, like mid twenties. I was. So I opened the first strip club in March two thousand and four. So I was twenty three, twenty twenty three at the time. Uh, For somebody at twenty three to get into that business, they must have looked at you and thought he's a kid. And then somehow you sold yourself as a businessman. Yeah, for the manager to leave to work for a twenty-three-year-old. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's funny because you know you look back and you think about those things more now when you're older and yes. uh, and 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 you you look at your younger self or you look at other younger people. But I guess you know at, at the time I I guess I didn't know any I didn't really have any choice, did I? You know, I, I, my age it, my age was what it was, and uh, if if anyone had any any stumbling blocks or hesitations because of my age it was just my job to uh, my job to overcome them and I think you know I think I mean even today and I I make the mistake or or, or make make the, the rudeness if you like of of when you see somebody young you do immediately gravitate to the fact that ooh, you know they can't know as know as much as somebody else and I had this conversation recently with uh, one of my business partners who uh, I have a business with now, she's 27, 28. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this is, I mean, being young in any business is being young, but the business that me and her have together uh, is um, a financial services business where we lend money to law firms. Now, she's run that business for the last five years, four or five years, you know, since... She's been 22. Yeah, 22, 23. Uh, So, I mean, people look at her young at 27, never mind look at her young at 22, 23. But we were having this conversation, I think ultimately... Unless the person you're talking to is just a total dick, even even if they look at you and go, "Hang on a minute, you're you're a bit young," and they're not going to say it, they're going to think it. As soon as they get one minute into a conversation with yeah, you, no. they know that you know what you're talking about. And like I said, unless unless they're just a dick themselves and they are, they are going to be prejudiced about you for anything, whether that's because you're, you're young, because you're black, because yeah. you're whatever, yeah. then then. It, it goes it, as long as you've got the skills, as long as you've got the competence. You know, it it, it goes it goes out the door pretty quickly, doesn't it? So, so you you the, you poach the manager. So poach the manager. You had the location already, and then you started looking for it. Um, you know, I, I forget exactly. I think I think I'd talked to him that he was going to come and work for me, uh, and he kept his other job at that time. But we kind of looked for a location at the time. Found a location in Wakefield. Did you have money in your pocket? So I did. I, I had some money. I had. I probably had. Let's say to my name about one hundred and fifty thousand pounds at that oh, point, wow, nice. which was which was from a combination of two or three houses that I uh, that I'd flipped. You know, along my earlier journey and some bits of savings. So I had about one hundred and fifty grand, nice. which was probably more than ninety nine percent of my peers, but certainly not enough to go to go and open a strip club. Um, so I, well, I, I guess I guess you you get me onto a specific specific story now. Um, 
So I found a club. I found a, found a club to buy. Oh, it's quite an interesting story, right? So let's, let's focus on that one. Uh, yeah, I've got tons of questions actually. Found a specific um, unit, Wakefield to, unit to buy in Wakefield. It was a freehold bar, so free freehold property, and don't hold me to the exact figures, but it was something something like three hundred sixty thousand pounds. So I went to the local bank, uh, HSBC, um, in Can I Wakefield. Look at your business plan. Well, yeah, and which which I, I did I did did have all that, all that stuff you know we we, we had a plan um, and but this was in the days and this was kind of probably wouldn't be possible now this was in the days when the local business managers could make the decision could make some decisions you didn't have to go to the head office exactly to, yeah yeah I, I mean I used to buy houses on a piece of paper oh where is it yeah yeah I know it's Summerfields yeah here's here's hundred grand yeah I mean yeah. The, the, there was limits to the yeah, you know, to the lending but I think Sorry. this particular guy could sign off up to about a million pounds okay. so. He agreed to give me a 70% loan to value loan on this 360 grand, which I probably put in, let's say, whatever, 100 grand, 110 grand, had a bit of stamp duty, a bit, 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 bit of other stuff, uh, and it probably left me 20 grand or something left over. But I bought the building, but we now had to go and do a refurb, which was going to be about another three or 400 grand. Which I now had no money to no money to go and do it with. However, the bank manager had agreed that once once I'd done the refurb, once I had the building revalued, there was some margin. For he, more he would further he, loans. he'd then go go and give me a further loan against it. So if I could get to the end, I'd already had the value. I was looking and say, well, when this is finished and trading, it's 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 going to be worth you know worth around a million pounds. Therefore. The guy that the manager would have lent really me about a couple of hundred thousand well, or three hundred thousand, quite a lot more would have probably lent me another three or four hundred. And sure. basically, would have lent me enough for the refurb to cover the full price of the refurb. But the problem was, I needed to pay, I needed to pay for it up front to get it back. I didn't have the money, uh, and thought, well, I've got no choice but to but to go on a wing and a prayer here. So I gave, I, I found a local contractor, gave them whatever I had left, this you know fifteen twenty twenty thousand pounds. That was my deposit to get going. We agreed a you know, a weekly a weekly payment schedule, uh, and at the end of the first week, I obviously haven't got a penny to pay them with. Managed to you know blag them for another week or so. Even VIP tables. <laughs> well, well, no, because because the, the venue's not the, oh, the, the, the oh venue's God. not open. I would have thought with a circle, you just turn the lights off. <laughs> right, you don't need oh, to. I mean, this place was as good as derelict. Oh, I mean, literally yeah. as good as derelict. So um, we got to kind of got to week two. By the time we got to week three, you know, their, no their, their, their patience has run out, and the, you know, they, ha they haven't had any money. And I just had to come clean with these guys and say, listen, I'm very sorry, but I haven't got any money. I can, you know, here is a piece of paper that shows that this bank manager is going to give me is going to give me a new loan once the place is finished. But between us, we have a problem now. You know, <laughs> that's my my problem. Is your problem? <laughs> I either yes, walk away now and you know leave me in a mess, and I'll never open the bar, and you'll never get the probably hundred grand I I already owe you. Wow. Or finish your job off, cash flow it for me. Put a bit of extra money on there as as, as some some punishment I'll for me, so, so some some extra profit, and when we get finished, you'll um you, you'll you'll be able to get your money because we'll get a refinance with the bank manager. I mean, these are tough questions for a twenty four year old, right? It's yeah, I mean, I I, I had I, I wouldn't say I was doing it from a, a position of great knowledge. I mean, listen, I, I'd I'd heard of heard of these kind of theories, uh, mm -hmm. you know, at the at the time, you know, I, I didn't invent the concept, you know, I, I'd I'd heard of other people do stuff like that before me, but I uh, I had I had no had going, no choice. Going to your dad was not an option. No, it it wasn't uh, for 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 two, for two reasons. I mean, listen, my 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 dad sold his business for you know for for, for good money back in nineteen nineteen ninety eight and. That, you know, I, I can. I never hide hide away from that. You know, I can't. Uh, I can't claim a, a rags to riches story. You know, I I, I came from a, a nice background, but when my dad sold his business, one of two things. First of all, he kind of <laughs> went on a systematic spending <laughs> spending spree, uh, both spending and investing, uh, and the investments he made, unfortunately, you know, di didn't didn't really work out. He also had a very smelly divorce from my mum, and he was absolutely 
horrified at the thought of me opening a strip club. <laughs> so when you uh, lots I mean, of negatives, when, there, yeah. when you add all of those together, first of all, he probably wasn't really in a position to 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 give me any money by then, even if he'd have wanted to. I mean, yes, he probably had the cash, but you know, he'd, he'd his had dwindled so so much that he you know he he, he didn't want to be giving it to me. But uh, more importantly, even if he had all the money in the world, he wasn't going to be investing in in, that in, in, in his son. In the, I mean, there was almost a point where we didn't speak for weeks if not months because he was he was so ashamed of what I was doing because he was convinced that ultimately that would rub off on him mm -hmm. and you know his his respectability his position in the community was now com was now compromised and damaged because um, you know his son was some uh, Your sex, father's sex still with us. Yeah, still no, with us yeah no he's still with us uh, very much so and basically what happened i mean <laughs> He'll probably tell a different story to me, but the way I remember it was we weren't speaking for a while and the club opened and it transpired that many of his friends would be coming, would be coming to my club and saying to him, oh, yeah. Matt's club's great, Matt's club's oh, great. Right. And I think he kind of probably realised it wasn't it wasn't such a bad thing after all. Um, and not that he ever approved, but he, but he kind of stopped. Uh, stopped I'm not going to ask him if he ever intended. He, he went, he went <laughs> in once or twice because I dragged him in with his friends, but he certainly yeah. didn't sit there yeah. drinking, drinking and getting a lap dance now. Um, so you opened. Uh, so, so, managed, so they said yes. Let's the, the, do it. We'll long, story, it. long story short, they said they, they said yes. Um, I mean, don't go wrong. It wasn't that quick. It was, there was there was a lot of grovelling, a lot of a lot of apologies, and a lot of negotiations. But they said yes. The club opened, and it it, it hit the it hit the ground running. Um, I mean, you know, I, I always probably played out my my input in it and say it was, you know, it was the right place at the right time, uh, which it was. I mean, the, the, you know, I think any any business uh, it still is about the right place at the right time, no, no matter how uh, how good your plans are, how good your execution is. But I think you know we. We had a very clear plan, for, and for me, that was to take to take what I'd learned as the the proper principles of doing business, you know, of sales, of marketing, of of operations, of staff welfare, mm -hmm. etc., and apply them to a business that would never normally have had that stuff because. I guess it's a bit, look, it's a bit different now. It was now. like an underground, absolutely like dirty, I mean, naughty, completely yeah, I mean, gangsters did it to wash money and all that. Exactly. Business. If you look at my competition, there, there was no proper business owners there. You say there, there, there were gangsters who were doing it to launder money. At best, it might be a rich guy who wanted one for fun as a play yes. toy. Um, but they, you know, in America we had Spearmint Rhino, which was getting getting more prevalent then, and they brought you know a big corporate mentality to it. But in the, in England, no, it was it was it was a, a, an underworld business. So I wanted to have, I, I wanted it to effectively not be that. I wanted customers to feel you know safe. I wanted girls to want to work there. I you know down to everything, down to you know our security would be more like concierges and security. Local light and yeah. You know, yes, we would charge a healthy premium for our drinks because we could but we wouldn't have your eyes out you know i don't know if a local pint of beer was three pounds then we might be four pound fifty or something okay. we're not going to be 11 pounds, 12 pounds yeah, you know yeah. so uh, th that was always my plan uh, i think look, we've got some good press i mean as a 24 year old opening a strip club it was going to be a, a media worthy story um, so yeah, all, all the boxes were kind of ticked uh, and um, and we, we hit the ground running and it was it was a success from the outset um, and over the next few months, I obviously, I ha but I was back to having no money because to pay everybody the, off. I, I'd paid everybody off. I'd refinanced the building that had gone to the builders, and you know, I, it was putting food on the table, and I had a nice asset, but I certainly wasn't rolling in it. And I, um, I came across um, a finance broker. I think I must have been introduced to him by a bank manager. Didn't really know what he was, what he did, but he explained to me that you know he worked in the world of asset finance. And the asset finance was basically securing loans against assets that you either already owned or wanted to buy. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess, you know, we all understand that in terms of car finance, you know, probably everybody has probably had a car loan at some point in time. And, you know, from a business perspective, asset finance for your business is just like taking yeah, a, instead of the car, taking a car against the property or the business itself. Yeah, or okay. the assets. An asset, you yes. know, typically, you know, well, it depends what your business Could is. Be printing well. press, machines, and equipment. And Absolutely. Stuff. Now, in my business, we our assets were different because we'd have things like air conditioning units or fridges mm -hmm, or sound mm -hmm, systems mm -hmm. or whatever it may be. So this finance guy, he said, look, I can raise you some money against some of your assets. And I still probably didn't really understand what he meant, but he kind of comes in the office one day, has some papers for me to sign. 
I says, okay, this air conditioning that you, that you paid 30,000 pounds for, we'll give you that 30,000 pounds back. And we now own your air conditioning, but you can rent it back from us for whatever it was, yes. 600 pounds a month or something. So I am signed the paper. Next thing I know, I've got 30 grand in my bank and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm basically paying someone some finance for my air conditioning. Oh, that's good. You know, what, what else can I go and uh, raise some finance against? And, you know, over the coming months, I started to meet other lenders, meet other finance brokers and, and, and raise finance against, against other assets in my business, which at about the same time, somebody approached me and offered me uh, a failing spin at Rhino nightclub down the road in Harrogate to buy. And I knew the club very well because I've been going there as a customer for years and years. Uh, and I thought this this is a club that could definitely make money because I looked at it and knew that from the from my perspective, one of the reasons it wasn't making money for Spearman Rhino, probably the main reason it wasn't making money for them, wasn't because it wasn't taking any money. It was because all the staff were robbing it blind. And, you know, the, these security guys, they had their little little wheeze. The daughter, the receptionist had his wheeze. The bar staff did. The DJs did. Everybody, no control, everybody was robbing in some way. Uh, and I thought, and even well, as a customer, you could see it. Yeah, ab- absolutely. <clears throat> because, um, well, well, I guess because I was on the receiving end of that benefit. Yes. So, you know, you give the bar. One of the reasons, I, I sidetrack here, but one of the main reasons for it was actually a big culture difference because Spearmint Rhino, being an American business, uh, is is all about that American culture of of tipping of service. Yes. Now that is now listen. I'm believe me, I'm 100 percent behind the tipping culture. And I think that's why that's why you get uh, you get great service you should, over, you uh, should. over over there. Mm. But in the UK, we you know we just we don't mm. we're tight, aren't we? You know we don't tip, and if someone does give a tip, they kind of really expect something in return yes. for it. So what you've got is the bosses at Spearmint Rhino were basically forcing tipping within the business. And uh, but therefore the staff would go above and beyond to earn that tip. Yes. So, for example, the guy on the front door who's the receptionist collecting, you know, collecting the reception money. You know, me, you, and a couple of friends turn up, and instead of charging us twenty pounds each, and that being eighty pounds for the thingy, so ten each. So I'll give him a ten pound tip. You know, yes. and then they'll charge ten each or yes, or, or, yes, or nothing. Yes, yes, yes. You know, you go and tip the barman well. All of a sudden, he starts giving you free drinks. Yes. The girls are encouraged to tip the DJ. The girls are also, in, but this is by management. The girls are also encouraged uh, to tip the security staff. Well, we, you know, which member of staff in the UK is going to think it's normal to start tipping yeah, their exactly. colleagues? But so therefore, these colleagues want the tip, but they have to do something in return. Mm-hmm. So you know, you tip the DJ, and the DJ then forgets to put them on stage you know you tip the doorman and the doorman forgets to uh you know to to, to charge them commission that they should be getting mm-hmm. so all all of this was going on in the business which ultimately meant revenue wasn't making its way to spearmint rhino so i knew that i could go in the next day and either fire people or lay the law down and uh you know th- there was probably Back in those days, literally four or five thousand pounds a week of revenue, a very high margin revenue, that was just that was just never even making it to the till, uh, and that that's what I did. Um, you know, fired some people, laid the law down with others. Um, obviously, there's the there's the, the threats that fly around, like you know, like, like there is 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 in, in any of these businesses. You know, I mean, but your know, best case, you go to a new town in England and you say, oh, it's different around here. You know, you don't know how it works around here. Mm-hmm. But if it's not different it's in any awesome. town, it's not different in any country. Could you, know? you take care of yourself then? Do you have like bodyguards? Or something? No, no. You know what? I I I, I never really had any problems. With 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 gangsters or or, mm-hmm. or, or with with trouble, you know, back in that business. Mm-hmm. I, I think that there's there's probably two two or three reasons. I do think England is you know I've got many many criticisms of England, but I th- I do think we are um, we, we've got a let's say a gangster culture that in the main respects the law. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's stupid. I don't mean respects the law. Obviously, they're a bit. What, what, they, what, what, they what I mean within is, certain boundaries. Yeah, yeah yes. w- w- within boundaries, or they would pay attention to you know to, to police, mm-hmm. etc. Whereas you know you go into a Russia or a, or whatever, they don't, I mean, they don't give a fucking monkey. Exactly. They? They'll they'll shoot the president. Um, but in, in England, we you know we don't really get. But that. It is the president. So again, or, so or, it yeah. is the president. Yeah. <laughs> but in in England, as long as I kind of always find that as long as you keep them at arm's length, as long mm-hmm. as you don't get involved in that world, mm-hmm. uh, you kind of won't have have any trouble. But once you cross the line, 
then th- sure. th- then then it's a different world. And I always, you know, if we go to a local town. So I always had two things. One, I had some very strong security guys from my local town, where I gave them the 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 mandate to go and hire security in the local towns mm-hmm. because because as as our business grew we went in uh, you know went to whatever Birmingham Manchester Liverpool I don't know who the players are in those towns and it would be very easy for me to hire a security firm which they don't let certain people in they don't hire that members of that yeah agency uh, exactly yeah. and 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 they you know they're they're naughty boys and you know yeah. and once i've got them in yes. I, can, i can never and if i've got the wrong correct, people correct, i can never correct, get them out correct, again correct. so what i do is i use my local guys and i basically pay them an override if you like to go and hire the local ones because they would know because in that if you're in that world you know everybody don't you they would go to manchester and there might be let's say three families or whatever in manchester and they would know the right one to partner with and then also if there were any problems here i wouldn't talk to the guys in manchester i'd talk to the guys in leeds Correct. and they would sort it out for me so, so so that was that was one clear strategy was it worth it having to think about all this stuff because i'm thinking one you drop the ball once and these guys can beat you up beat the place up to I don't know, rank the joints. No, I, I mean, look, look, we ne- we honestly never saw any, any, anything like that. And like I said, I think for, for two reasons. W- w- one, we, we, we had the right people in yes. because of that, that theory. And also, let's say, you know, the, the local gangsters or whatever wanted to come in. We, we'd always have very clear conversations that, look, you want to come in, you're more than welcome to come in, but you won't be selling your drugs in here. Mm-hmm. You won't be misbehaving in here. Mm-hmm. You know, we can, we can have a nice relationship with each other yes. but this is a venue that you can come and have a drink and hang out in it's not a venue that, that you're going to be selling drugs or, or or exerting any control over but they could bring 20 of their mates and stuff like that so you, you're limited to number of people you could come in oh no, no so I, i don't mean we gave them fr- free reign to do whatever but but y- yes we may we may pay them let's say more respect than we would you know mm-hmm. pay a normal guy as in yes for sure they could come in for free yes. when somebody else could but they're still paying for their drinks they're still you know at the end of the day look if i knew you i'd be letting you in for free anyway sure. so it, it's not it's not like they've got this special special sure. pass and they were quite reasonable if you treat them with respect ab- ab- absolutely but i think the problem comes in when you for example then then say oh yeah you can sell some drugs in here but give me mm-hmm. free, give, give me mm-hmm. some drugs mm-hmm. as well mm-hmm. or give me a commission or whatever and then then it, then you've crossed the line then you're in their world Shit, and then they've got you yes. by the balls and and and, and it's completely different but because Because we never crossed that you line, kept it clean. you know, we we never, you know, we we never never really had had any trouble. But listen, I I'll do clubs in England all day long because I I believe that we have a controlled environment where I can operate like that. I always get asked, oh, why don't you do a venue in Spain? Why don't you do this in France? And I wouldn't touch. I just would not go any, near any other country because over there it is a completely different world mm. where where the underworld run you know run the different locales yeah. and you know like marbella you know I, you know i have a house in marbella spend the summer there love the place but i couldn't think of anything worse than doing any business there i mean you know i opened a bar in marbella three russians walk in the next day and say matt we now we're now your partners what the fuck am i going to do about it? <laughs> you know so russians are strong in marbella well or whether it's russians or bulgarians or, 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 or it is or, the or, underworld or whatever yeah, yeah. There, there's there's the real the real underworld and you know I, I I don't want to set my life up to what be to, be, to be take in that the whole world. thing. I'm off. Exactly. I mean, what, yeah. what 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 can you do when someone goes? We we're now your fifty fifty partner. All right. The next week, oh, you know what, Matt? We're now seventy five twenty five. Really? I, I mean, it's and and you you know you hear these stories all I the time. I lived in Estepona. Oh, really? Yeah, for a couple of years. Hated it. I thought Costa del Crime, and all my neighbors were like dodgy and stuff like this. It was just like it wasn't for me. You said, but I I do love it there. But I think I think it's kind of where like, like what you do or don't get involved in. Like you know, a lot of my friends. So how, you know, why do you like Marbella so much? You know, there's all these you know Liverpool gags, gangsters on the run there, or there's all this crime in these mm-hmm. venues. Well, there is if you go to those venues, you know. But there's also lots of beautiful places there. Sure. And, you I know, actually really liked it, but I had some. Bad experiences with the Spanish police, I'll tell you later. Okay. <laughs> so, um, one thing I, I don't hear you say, we're going to go to the whole journey as well. I was well, going to say, yeah, we um, <laughs> missed out I a lot never, of the story. I never hear you talk about, like, it was difficult hiring girls. No, absolutely not. The girls was was, was the easiest bit. Really? Because, uh, in simple terms, the girls go where the money is. Uh, so, all, all my job was to do was to provide a club which would be a high-grossing club. 
because if if the club was going to make money, that the girls would therefore make money. There's never a shortage of them. There's all. So I'm not going to say there was never a shortage here and there. For example, it's always easy to get people to work on a Saturday night than it, when it's very busy than it mm-hmm. is on a Tuesday, okay. Tuesday night when it's very quiet. But you also need different numbers. So let's say if, if on a Saturday we needed 40 girls, on a Tuesday, Wednesday we might need eight to 10 girls. So what? We, and and listen, there was also there was always some girls who were, would prefer a midweek to a weekend. Yes. Uh, and just like say, you know. Just like salespeople who behave or or thrive differently in different environments, you know, you would have some girls who needed to work on a Saturday because they needed that heavy throughput of customers, uh, and and they would just go, da- you know, quick dance, quick dance, quick dance, because almost they weren't good salespeople. They were just hot girls. Relying on the yeah, yes. they were hot girls that were relying on traffic, and they therefore had an easy. So there's never a shortage of hot girls. A short, I'd say there's a shortage of hot girls, but it's but the club, um, yes. but. The, looking at that kind of job as stripping there's pl- there was plenty of girls there, there wasn't there wasn't let's, let's say plenty of hot girls okay. but the other thing i learned very quickly as well is we all have our own definition of what is a hot girl mm-hmm. and uh, you know i would when i first started i was like right we're only going to hire the hottest girls and they're all going to look like this but two problems. One, that's my version of a hottest girl. You know, if I like whatever, if I like blonde, blonde tall, haired, thin, blonde whatever, haired yes. tall English girls, yes. maybe you don't, you know, yes, just yes, just, yes. You know, just because I don't like short girls or, you know, Filipino girls or yes, whatever, yes. Whatever, whatever it may be. Somebody else, some, when, somebody when else loves them. When you look at revenue, were you shocked sometimes? Or do you thought, no, actually, I can tell that, for instance, that lady with her personality... Well, did, did a kind of pattern develop? So, I mean, I was always shocked, you know, mm-hmm. staggered at times by by some of the girls that would, like I'd look at a girl and, and this supermodel would walk through the door and I thought, oh my God, she, you know, she's going to be earning fortunes. And she'd ultimately earn not very much or nothing. And you'd see her depressed at the end of the night going, I'm not earning enough money. And what, again, you'd learn very quickly is, well, hang on, you're not learning earning money for a couple of reasons. One, you're arrogant and you think that because you're really mm-hmm. hot, mm-hmm. everyone's going to come up to you and and ask you for a dance. Yes. Okay, that might be true to a degree, but not every not everybody's going to. And and secondly, uh, you know, maybe you just don't try. Maybe you just don't don't put any effort in. Then we've you know we had some other girls. I remember this girl. I remember this day called Candy. That was her name, Candy, and she was a monster. I mean, this girl was utter, utterly horrific. Or rather, that was my that my my opinion was she was utterly horrific. She would earn fortunes on nights when there was no customers in there. Because she was proactive. She was proactive. She wouldn't take no for an answer. You know, if we if we if we switch this conversation into into sales, you know, she could objection handle. <laughs> you know, yeah, she, yeah, yeah. she could well, it is sales. build a pipeline. Really. And, 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 and it yeah. and absolutely they are the is. Brand. You yeah. know, uh, and and even things like you know pl- planning for the weeks ahead. You know, okay, I, you, you, we've done a dance tonight. Are you going to be coming in next week? Because I'm going to be working wow. Tuesday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. I'd I'd, I'd love to see you again, uh, or, or 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 whatever it is. Um, also, you know, we talk about. How much effort do people put in? At the end of the day, they, they, they just like in a in a working environment in the office. If you're a salesperson, you come in and work for six or seven hours, eight hours, whatever it is in the office. If you spend your eight hours smashing that telephone, you're, ultimately you're you, going to make money. Yes, exactly. If you spend that, you know, if you spend five of those eight hours messing around, texting, interneting, chit chatting in the cafeteria, planning. somewhere else, yeah, <laughs> planning, yeah. you're not you're not going to make much money. Mm. Apply that to the strip club thing. The eight hours that you're in there, you've got two choices. You can walk around dragging customers in and, you know, taking them for a dance and really extracting some money, or you can sit at the bar and drink. You can sit in the change room and, wait. and chat shit with the with the other girls. And that, that's just the strip club equivalent of the same as what Did goes on some in the sales training? world. Do you say before they start, the key to success is this? Did we, we do we do mm-hmm. tell them but ultimately we kind of also all also leave that leave the, have to leave them to it to a degree sure. because that you know look, they're all self-employed girls yes. who ultimately you know to a degree it's their choice what they do we say to them listen okay you may be self-employed but these are our rules that you must stick to so for example if you want to work on a particular night then you work from the beginning to the end because again let's say they uh, come when he suits them type of thing yeah when it's the busiest if, if it was up yes. to them they would say well on a saturday night we'll turn up at 10 30 because yes. it's going to be busy at 11 yes, yes, yes. 
And okay, that's lovely for you, but for me, that means that when people walk in at eight and nine o'clock, I've got no girls in there. So we'd so we'd lay down certain rules like that. So for example, if you work on a weekend night, you must also give me a midweek night. Mm -hmm. If you're working a shift, you must work work from beginning to end. But what we um, but ultimately, it would become very self self policing, Mm -hmm. self regulating Mm -hmm. that. If a girl didn't earn any money, she just wouldn't come back. Sure. And and we can I can tell you all the things in the world of why I think you're not making any money. But just just like in an office environment, you know, everyone thinks they know better, don't they? And that's right. the sales guys go, well, your leads are shit. You know, oh, you know, your your marketing's crap or your product's crap. Well, nobody else is having any trouble selling it. Your problem is you've made seven phone calls today, mate. Yeah, yeah. crap. And and it's just it's it, it's exactly the same. You know, it's exactly the same with the well, girls. I actually looked into this business back in England, and I thought, you know what, councils. <laughs> Did you have trouble getting like no? Listen, this was one of the reasons I got out of the business in the end because the laws, the the council laws changed yes. when I started. It was so easy. They were opened. Um, I mean, I mean, there was there was just a very defined um, licensing structure that you needed to get needed to get. Nobody, you, you layman wouldn't understand it. That's why you know we always think it's so complicated. Just like in I don't know, like if. Somebody talks about the financial services business. Oh, you don't want to get into financial services. It's so heavily regulated. You were well, okay, it is. But once you know what to do, you know you know how to navigate exactly. it. And it was the same attitude or the same logic with strip clubs. People would go, oh, how, that, how do you get a license? That must be like a one in a million chance. Absolutely not at all. It's a very defined way that if you approach the council and say, I want to have a strip club license and this is my venue. And these are the parameters of that. Yes, yes. Then they actually legally have to give it to you. Obviously, I also also had a, had our lawyers who would work on our behalf to do it because mm. there'd be t- you know, some councils would want to try and fight the law from their side. Yes. Say, okay, well, it might be the law that you're allowed it, but we don't want it. So we're going to try and find a way to fight it. So we, we had our lawyers to deal with it all. But what happened around... Probably around 2009, 2010, I think it was, the laws changed. Um, and they they changed it. You're getting very technical and boring now. But in the beginning, the licenses used to be um, an extension of a normal bar or club license. You know, in, in England, I forget I forget what we call them, but you know, we, we ask for a, a public entertainment license that allows you to do dancing or you know yes. entertainment. And we have an alcohol license, you know, those, those two things. And... Every, typically, every public entertainment license would have one specific condition on it that prohibited you from doing any strip type entertainment. Okay. So what you would then just do is apply to the council and say, "Please, can it's you remove license? Guy. Well, they or, just or remove it. Remove that condition. I see. Which, as long as you did tick, 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 then then they had to remove it. And once you've got that license, you have basically got it forever. It lives with that venue forever. Okay. And unless you do something utterly stupid you know selling drugs yeah, or, they have or whatever the accounts. and even if you're doing that you've still probably got two or three chances to correct yourself before you know, before, oh. before they do remove it but what happened was in 2010ish i think it was they changed the license uh, to what's called a sex establishment license and that license is the same kind of license that um a massage place no like a sex cinema or a sex shop okay. or an Anne Summers or something something like that okay. And the, there was two big differences. One was cost. The, these licenses, you know, the old public entertainment licenses used to cost about 200 quid a year. These new sex establishment licenses could be costing 20 grand a year. Now, the money itself wasn't a problem because we were very profitable units. But the big issue was, first of all, each council then could make their own rules on how many of these that they would give out. And they all lasted for one year. Oh, no, you have to keep renewing you and fighting for it. You have to keep, keep renewing and fighting for it. So all of a sudden, that just makes it very un, unviable to invest in the businesses. Mm. Because, you know, if you're going to invest in a business where there's a three-year payback, you need to know that, well, at a bare minimum, you've got three years, don't you? Yes. I, I, ideally yes. more. But the problem with this is you've got a guarantee of one year. And it's not even like there's any... How can you establish any business we, not knowing if you're going to have the license exactly. in the second Exactly. And, and it's not even like you could take a commercial view and say, well, okay, you have to renew every year, but these are the parameters. So 99 times... Well, they could change will be fine. anytime. You're at, you're at the whim of some local councillor who A, isn't a business person and, and can never get their head around it, and B, always wants some opportunity to you know to jump on the soapbox yes. and talk. And that ultimately, that's why we lost that. The only license we lost was the one in Leeds. All well, the other ones we kept, but we How lost the one. How did you have at the end? 
The 11, the peak no. had, had 11 wow. script. Was, you said was, London as well? You I didn't have London. I was down south. I was in Bristol, Blackpool, wow. Birmingham. I, I was the biggest operator in the UK in, t- in, terms, of, in terms of numbers of venues. All within four years, five years. Yeah. So you were always greedy, good greedy. But then did you have a, did you have a normal life? Because these are all opening evenings and weekends. Did you have a oh. balanced life? I know you had a fun life, I'm sure. I mean, look, t- 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 two, two answers to the question. There. Two answers to the question. One is I, um, I mean, yes, I was kind of working all the time because I'd work through the day to run the business, yes. you know, to, to find the next venue, to deal with the banks, to do whatever running a business in the day meant. But then I'd also be visiting the venues every night as well, whether that was because I was checking up, mm-hmm. genuinely checking up, mm-hmm. or whether it's because I was going in there drinking to ent- you know, to entertain some clients or entertain. Yes, so yes. I didn't really have any off time. But you know, I also listen, my my business today isn't really any different. My business life isn't any different to that anyway. And I look at it quite simply and say, well, look, my business is my life, is my interest, is my hobby. So do I have a balanced life? I mean, what is a balanced life? I mean, to me, a balanced life is is doing what you want to do, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I do think I do what I want to do. It's just that, you know, someone looks at me and goes, what, you've worked 80 hours this week. What's the matter with it's you? It's not work, though. Well, that's what I want yeah, to yeah, do, yeah, you know. Exactly. What do you want me to do? You want me to go and play golf? I don't fucking like golf. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, like yeah, you know, absolutely. you know, I'll, I'll look at your life and say, well, I think I've probably had more fun doing what I wanted to do than you yes. because I've got something, I've got an interest, you know, that, that, that I want to follow. So... I, I never really saw this word like that. Although ultimately, I, put, I did kind of get a bit tired. I mean, you know, I, I also I, my first child was born in two thousand. Was going to ask you about your relationship. Were you in a relationship? With I was. Ma- I was married to my first daughter's mum, which wow. wasn't great. <laughs> <laughs> was she insecure? That it was the, uh, the, you the know business what? you had. Uh, she wasn't insecure at all. Because you would have been only you know your late twenties, right? I was. Well, when my daughter was born, I was 25. Yeah. Uh, I think my wife was, a, she's about 14 months younger than me or something. Uh, Kids, really? She, yeah, yeah, completely. And she was young. a very, uh, I mean, listen, she was tolerant uh, tolerant beyond belief. Uh, and it, it was very difficult. Listen, I have a great relationship with her still now. We haven't, been, we haven't been married for a long time. Even when we were kind of divorced and falling out and stuff, we were, we, we never really caused each other too many problems because ultimately she's you know she's a wonderful wonderful person both now and at the at the age of 20 odd i wasn't a bad guy i just wanted to shag everything that moved you know i mean i mean and i'm not ju- found that. i'm not justifying it for one minute but it's very difficult to be 24 25 running strip clubs making a load of money Having and not being distracted. having every girl, I mean, literally almost every girl on offer. I mean, it was like it was like being a, a movie star, being a football player. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, you know, yeah. it, it was the talk of town as well. I guess right, right? completely. So I, I couldn't behave myself, and I think she kind of turned a blind eye and turned a blind eye until, until she wouldn't turn a blind eye. And uh, uh, but yeah, still she kind of gave me chances to repair the relationship. But I don't know. Yeah, I think ultimately I knew that we kind of wanted different things and. Um, we probably both fought each. She probably tried to make me something I wasn't. I tried to pretend to be something I wasn't. And all I think eventually we both got old enough to uh, accept it was it wasn't going to work. And you know I needed to let her be happy and she needed to let me do whatever. But you know we was never it painful. No, it was. Well, listen, it was, there's obviously times of it being sad, but I think because like I say, she was such a decent person. Um, that and we had a we had a child between us that there was never obviously there, there was some fiery arguments you know she comes at me with a rolling pin or <laughs> whatever it may be but once that there was never bitterness or I, I, you know like her trying to cause me harm or malice mm. and I look at you know I mean I look at other people getting divorced other people in in relationships that are breaking down you know, like close friends of mine and stuff where their lives are, are miserable absolutely yes. miserable with horrendous and okay listen, I, I'm not being sexist about it obviously normally if it's my male friends it's probably the women going at them but you see it as much with men as well that you know that they're jealous that the girl's gone and got with a, a guy who's better looking with more money so they mm-hmm. you know they, 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 yes. want, they want to make make their life make their life miserable but no mine was always great absolutely great and you know we're, we're, we're good friends to today she's engaged right now she's marrying someone else next year 
you know, we're, we're having... You wanted the best for her. Yeah, I do. How old's your daughter now? Teenager? My daughter now is 17, 17 oh, and a bit. Wow, amazing. So she was, here, she was here in Dubai about a amazing. week ago, actually. Amazing. Uh, and then, but then I had another baby six months ago. I know, ago, we're going to so, talk about yeah. She's <laughs> absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. I think you're addicted to her, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. She's um, she's a little character. Yeah, because I had, I had children. I had two from my previous marriage and two from my recent marriage, and they give me a zest of life, the new ones, the baby ones, the, you know, the, no, the she's, younger. She, she's good fun. Gorgeous. We're going to talk about that. So uh, you opened 11 Yeah, clubs. so we're, we're kind of getting to the big bit now. We're getting to, so um, yeah. we're, we're kind of circa 2008. Um, I had 11 strip clubs. I'd been learning how to borrow money, so I've been borrowing money left, right, and centre. Do you have other businesses as well? Yeah, or? so from, from that borrowed money, I wasn't just doing the strip clubs. I also had normal bars and clubs. I had opened a chain of juice bars, restaurants, property business. So you didn't sit on cash, you invested no, in was all, business. No, always, always opening something new, always have, having a new idea, whether it was my own or whether it was partnering with somebody else. But we were completely over leveraged. I mean, we were. I always say we were a deck of cards built on a on a bed of sand, uh, and the one card. Well, yeah, and that card came with the credit crunch of two thousand and eight. Uh, and I'm, listen, I'm not for one second um, saying it wasn't my fault and it was the fault of the credit crunch, but the credit crunch was what started. Yeah, when your repayments are far more than your what your income is, I went through that in the eighties with Margaret Thatcher's before mm-hmm. your time, and where interest rates quadrupled. And my rent wasn't covering a quarter of my interest payments. I was screwed. Well, my, I had I had ten houses. Well, my my problem really was that you know I was taking I was taking on debt that was always going to be unsustainable. But I was I guess I was young and naive and hungry. Uh, and It'll go on forever. And, and and I kind of thought it would go on forever. And if I was ever short of money. It was always so easy for me to borrow some more. You know, we'd get to the end of the month if we were 50 grand light for payroll or 100 grand light mm-hmm. to pay a contractor for a club. I had a, a Rolodex of 80 different lenders that I could ring up and go, hey, you know, send me another 50 Crazy. grand, send me another 100 grand. Yes. And obviously, talking about it in hindsight, you know, it's, it's, it's obvious it was unsustainable. But as a 25, 26 year old, on my first cycle, if you like, coupled with the fact that the people who were give, giving me this money, I mean, like, I never held a gun to anyone's head. I mean, they, yes. as, much, as much as I wanted to I borrow know, money, I, I was there. They was wanted there. to lend money. Banks were coming to me, bank managers kissing my ass, wanted to give me money. And um, and when the credit crunch came, they wouldn't pick up my call. Mm. Yeah, it was amazing. You know, I, I I very quickly went from golden boy to you know yeah. to, to to persona non grata, there. and literally in the space of two months. Uh, so what happened was the credit crunch started to happen. So that dried up all the liquidity. That meant my lenders then didn't have any more money to give. So when I get to the end of the month and I needed some more, Cash they wouldn't give me it. So I then realized I had a problem. I went back to all my lenders to say, I have a problem. Um, you know, I can't pay you back over two years anymore or over three years. I want to do a deal with you to pay you over six or seven or ten or whatever it may be. I'm not asking anyone to take a take a loss, take a haircut. Just give me longer to pay it back. And I always maintain that if this sort of happened a year later, I'd probably be telling a very different story. Back then, whilst everyone knew some trouble was coming, they didn't really know how bad it was going to, to be. That extent, yeah. And they all, well, not all, but most of them said, "We're not going to give you any concessions." because we don't need to, because we've got your personal guarantee and you'll find a way to make it work. I'm saying, I've got, I think I had 47 million pounds worth of personal guarantees. Where do you think that money's coming from? Maybe I'll find a million, maybe I'll find two, I don't know, but I'm not finding 47. And they say, well, you you don't want to go bankrupt, you'll find a way. So I don't want to go bankrupt, but (laughs) I'm also not going to find 47 million quid. Um, And, you know, went away. The next day, the first letter comes from, you know, from one of the creditors coming after me. And I thought at that point, there's no point in me fighting it, defending it, because if I get past this guy, there's the next guy, the next guy. Uh, and I basically had to put my hands up. And within this, literally within the space of about two months from finding out I had a problem in June 2008 to the beginning of September, the, all the businesses were in, in administration and I'd been made personally bankrupt. Uh, so and it the was a spectacular England, fall from grace. In England, they treat bankruptcy like you're a, you're an absolute criminal. Well, well, I yeah, when whether it's a fifty million, five hundred million, or fifty thousand for I, seven years or something, you can't trade. Am I right? Or those days? No. So so, so there was there was two two sides to it. That I mean, in theory, you should be in and out of the bankruptcy in a year. 
if you don't, as long as you not misbehaved in any way. But the problem is, even when you come out of the bankruptcy, you you marked. Yes, your credit is marked. So it takes you know it takes a long time. You can't to even rebuild. get it. You can't get an alcohol license if you have if you're in bankrupt. You can't become an MP. If you're um, bankrupt, I believe. Well, I'm, I'm sure you can't whilst you're bankrupt. I mean, in theory, when you're not bankrupt, you're probably able to, but it's something you have to declare. Mm -hmm. And then and yeah. then and then there's all kinds of, you know, let's yeah, say your payment has got high interest rates. Mitigating rate going, yeah. circumstances. Crazy. But, um, but in America they celebrate. Yeah. <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, because I've been through that a couple of times in England. So then what happened? So when bank went bankrupt, affected your personal relationship with your No, it did I mean listen, she she was I mean I guess she was driving fancy cars and fancy lifestyle and Yeah, that. I mean she, you know, listen, I'm not going to say she was over the moon about it. She but she was let's say she was more concerned about the situation than she was complaining that she's not got any Louis Vuitton shoes that week sure. or something because uh, and that's why look she she was she was a she was a good girl, you know, and um, I think you know we we, we can we all no, I mean it's, it's funny because you know guys who've got money who then lose money and lose the girl when they yes. lose the money go I can't believe she left me. I think, listen we all know the kind of girls we mess around with yes. right and and when you get with a girl who's got with you for the money you know she's got got you with with for the money I mean maybe you don't care because you know you want the hot girl so it's a a, a relationship of mutual you exchange. should be aware of what you're getting yourself into but when you lose the money and she disappears I mean please don't well, be surprised, surprised you know but no she, she uh, we never had we never had that problem I mean, she'd had more genuine concerns you mm -hmm. know how we're we going to look after our daughter how we're we going to pay the mortgage etc but n never was she she kicking my ass that you know we weren't driving a fancy car anymore um, but I, I always say that you know I never I don't have a, a motivating story to tell about how uh, you know how I went from bankrupt to you know to not feeling suicidal to going and making money again because ultimately I always say I didn't have a choice you know you know I went bankrupt one day uh, I've been told by most people that you know, well that was it I was finished I'm not yes. going to be working again uh, but I woke up the next day and I needed to put some food on the table and you know, I had two choices I can sit at home and and complain I can watch Jeremy Kyle and you know say that uh, the world I should be on that <laughs> yeah, so, yeah and talk about how the world's against me and mm -hmm. this should never have Victim. happened that's not going to get me paid um, so I, you know I went back went back out to work and and, and just and, and just just cracked on with trying to trying to generate an income and you know I didn't have a plan you know it wasn't like okay I've lost this but uh, this is going to be my new business model. you work for someone never no or I, started your... I went to uh, so, so my first let's say income producing activity after bankruptcy was being a finance broker because I'd already, just before the bankruptcy, I'd already started lending money and doing a bit of finance broking okay. anyway. And I'd become, I guess, because I'd learned how to borrow money, because I'd learned all the, who all these different lenders were, yes. uh, I was a bit of a go-to guy uh, in the in the local when people community. were looking exactly you know and, and i had lots of friends or or let's say people who knew of me who had successful businesses but they still needed some capital uh and outside of their banks they wouldn't know where to get it from so i, beca I became a finance broker um and really that's what got me back in the game and you know i keep saying long story short but it's it's not short it's is a it? great story man. you know th that that's let's say 2008 2009 and from 2009 to today the story has been started as a finance broker and as I'd make some money broking, I started to lend a bit of money. Uh, you became the bank? I, beca I became the lender. Wow. Um, started to find an investor or two to give me some money to go and lend on. Yes. Um, and then that's that's how, how, how I've built, built, built the model since. So um, what's the model right now? So the model right now is... You're in the UK? It, all my business is in the UK. I live in Dubai. I came to Dubai during COVID to dodge lockdown and never went back. Oh, just recently? Okay. Uh, yeah, I uh, came in December 2020, okay. Oh, amazing. Uh, literally, I'd never been to Dubai before. I came for an eight-day holiday. Um, and my holiday had run out and I was due to go back to England. But I was like, well, what am I going back for? It's lockdown. I, never, I didn't think I'm going to move to Dubai. I just thought, well, I'll just do another week here. Well, I'll just do another week here. Yeah, it's all right here. And now, yeah. uh, and then next next thing I know, I've I've I've, I've met a girl, bought a house, and uh, oh, you I'm, met your partner here. Yeah, yeah, we oh, met here. She, she, she recently. She came to Dubai about uh, about a month or so after I did. Is and, she also English? No, she's Finnish. Oh, fantastic! Finnish. So you met her in Dubai. Met her in Dubai. You got this beautiful daughter of yours. Yeah. What's her name? <laughs> uh, the baby's called Nelly. 
Nearly oh, she's no, absolutely gorgeous. So, yeah. Thank you. So everything's new to you. Um, so so the new life is new. Home, new, new, new life over new here, home. but yeah. So the business is all in the UK, and the right. business still is in the UK. Um, and what and we we provide secured loans to to SME businesses in the UK. Uh, so secured backed against some kind of asset, primarily property. Mm-hmm. So we do a lot of first charge lending, a lot of second charge lending. Yes. We've mentioned things like plant and machinery and debtor books earlier. You know, we, we'll, we'll, we'll secure against that. Um, and, you know, we do short term, nine to 18 month kind of term loans. Yes. We don't care what sector the business is in, but you know we're there. As long as they have assets. As long as there's an asset, but but I also we're not a pawnbroker, so it's mm. not just oh you've got an asset, so we'll definitely do a deal. You know, it's not like oh give it's me your a- money. You need to be able to. So, so, so the, 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 the asset's there to secure it, but ultimately we we want to think that the business is going to pay it back. So mm-hmm. by that, what I mean is, you know, we don't just go, okay, give me a hundred grand watch and I'll give you 30 yeah, because grand I'm, against because it. Because I'm after that watch. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to do you in. You want to see a viable business. Exactly. That you can support to build and grow and exactly. further financing. The, the security is there if it doesn't work out so mm-hmm. that we've got, because we don't want to lose our capital, we've got mm-hmm. something to fall back on. But ultimately we want the method of, repayment to be the you know the, to yes, be the business simple. itself moving forward so we've funded all kinds of businesses of all kinds of shapes and sizes from you know i think the smallest loan we've done all have been 50 grand the biggest loan i have on the books at the minute is to someone we lent nearly six million quid to wow. um, and that 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 is big for us to be fair but you know our bread and butter is probably numbers. half a million half a million is probably an, an average loan is your debt insured just no. in case yeah. really? Well, well, sorry, we, we, have, we have two products, so, so rather two different businesses. That would so be I, my worry, right? I'm down, I'm giving this guy six, six million and he goes, then it's going to take me how long to get it back? But it's not insured, but it's, secu- it's secured against an asset that we can that we But then assets about. is higher value than six million, so yes. you're not going to, ah, oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so okay. you're not going to send an auction for a million. And you're no, 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 no. So, 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 you know, if we're lending against property, we'll okay. typically be lending at 70%, 75% okay, so you're always going to be good. value. Okay. Or we're taking, you know, we're taking a debtor book or a plant, machinery, car, yes. you know, yes. w- w- whatever that may be. Do people come to you because they can't get it from the bank, so you're more flexible? So our two main re- our two main reasons to come to us will be speed and flexibility. Okay. So we have let's say very high quality customers who could get something from a bank who who could get it from somewhere cheaper than us, but it'll be a lot slower. Yes. you know we can turn a loan around in three or four days, mm-hmm. whereas you know the bank's going to turn it around in two months or three months. Even exactly. another lender like us is probably going to be a month. So you know our higher quality customers they come to us because of speed. Mm-hmm. And then our let's say our lower quality, but I don't want to you know be too degrading to them. Let's say our, our businesses that have got some story in there mm-hmm. come to us because yeah, other lenders won't lend. Mm-hmm. But you know, for, for me, I always say that look, we f- try and find a reason to do a deal. Most of the lenders, particularly the banks, find an excuse not to do not a deal. To, yeah. You know, so I could say, look, here's a great you know, let's usually we go here's here's a great business idea or not even an idea here's an existing business that you've got that's trading well here's an asset that we're going to secure it against um to um uh, in case it goes wrong Mm -hmm. that's the asset we're going Mm -hmm. to take back this is a nice deal yeah but in in 2009 he went bankrupt in a health club well, what the yeah. fuck's that? What's that, what's that exactly. got to do? What's that got to do with anything? Exactly. <laughs> and that's your decision. That's what makes you that flexible. The banks just, oh, oh, let's look into that. Yeah, get the magnifying glass. No, and, and I'm not saying that we don't look into. it. Obviously, I want, I want yeah. to, I what want happens, to know the picture. Yeah. I want to know who Tell I'm me dealing straight, with. Yes. But you know, I, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to prejudice a quality deal now over a 15 year old story that, that that bears no, no resemblance oh, on it whatsoever amazing. so i mean look if, if i gave you if i told you every single deal we've ever done no two deals are alike it's always a different story a different amount of money a different something but there's always some compelling reason why we think we should do the deal and some excuse as to why you know as to why some you know, little guy in credit said that they uh, said that they Good. shouldn't do it. So right now you you cash rich, then you're looking for people. to Listen, we're never in. cash rich. You know, if you if you if you're in the if if you're in the lending business, it's the got, it's, it's the most capital intensive uh, game in the world. Um, I mean, we've always got more opportunities that we want to lend on than than we've got okay. capital to do. So I spend I spend probably seventy percent of my working life um, trying Filthy. trying trying to find new money. Wow, you know, I w- I'm always building relationships. See, if with- I was an investor, I am. I invest. Yeah. So, what kind of, if you don't mind no, sharing it, what kind of returns would you be? 
So, so, so typically, our invest depending on what the underlying loans we're doing are, our investors will earn anywhere between ten and twelve percent. Okay. Um, so let, let's say let's say our our, our bigger bigger guys will be getting twelve but twelve percent per annum. Uh, you know, we have different kind of investment products. You know, we have yeah. a, a two year loan, like a two year loan note, a bond, yes, a three yes. three year loan note bond, uh, which your quick uh, turnover, your, your cash can be realized within two years. Absolutely. If you wanted to. Absolutely. So, and you know what? I mean, 10% of our guys want the money back, you know, the, but the vast majority is kind of yeah, keep it in. Money is good, keep it or compound it over a period of time. Well, yeah. ultimately, the typical investor for us is not Mrs. Smith who's down to her last 30 grand yes. and needs it back at some time. It's a high net worth individual who's got, well, that's whatever, 2 million, 3 million, 10 million of assets. Yeah. And they go, they're they always going to invest those assets in a diversified portfolio. And let's say if they give me 500 grand of their money, mm -hmm. well, they're not giving me the last 500 grand. They've got money in all kinds of different places. Okay. And therefore, unless I've done something very stupid, chances are they're going to leave it, leave it with me forever and ever. I'm not going to say that's always the case. Obviously, the last nine months has not been a great time in the world. Mm -hmm for anybody and no matter how much money you've got people have had a liquidity squeeze so yeah we've, we've had quite a few investors who've wanted some money back but you know they've, it's funny they've, they've been very apologetic about it really saying listen I'm, I'm sorry it's my circumstances have changed exactly no you, you've done nothing you, wrong yes. we just need to mm -hmm. get some capital back for a bit now but I'm sure I'm going to come back to you in a year or so uh, but yeah I mean what we offer an investor is a very passive return yeah. uh, it, it's, it's a strong return you know 10, 11, 12% asset backed nice and passive uh, and I mean there's no rocket science to what we do you know we pay our investors 12 we charge our borrowers 18 19 and you make the margin we the make the middle. margin in the middle but we find the we find the opportunities yeah. we underwrite them we manage them when there's problems we you know yes. we, we deal with them you know a lot of a lot of times you know when you're talking to people like oh well I can go and I can go and make a loan myself at 18 percent what do I want to give you 12 for well, I tell you, fine, but then go you go 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 and, you go and do my job. You know, okay, you might you might think you're getting eighteen percent, but how much time then are you wasting trying to find the deals, trying to you know trying to structure them, trying to do everything else? And more importantly, what happens when it goes wrong? Because it's very easy to lend money; it's a bit more difficult to collect it. Anyway. And you know, people can say, "Oh, well, I've got a lawyer, or he's told me that this is going to happen. He's told me that's going to happen." Yes, in theory, when things go wrong, this is the process that will play out. But the reality is, there's so it's many correct. nuances, so many little things that you that you just don't know until they, until they've gone wrong. Uh, and you know, I've managed to have lots of things go wrong, and I've managed to you know lose lots of my own money over the years. So that you know, I, I know, you know, I know what can go wrong, and ultimately, that's. That's what an investor is getting by mm. working with us. You know, mm. they're getting they're, they're getting the 10, 11, 12 percent, but they're getting it hassle, hassle free exactly. because we've got you know we've got yeah. years and years of experience. The only and, downside is the bloody inflation, isn't it? It's so high at the moment. It right? is, but but that's also I mean, look, that's a problem with, with whatever you're investing mm, in. Exactly. I think that you've got to decide: like, are you investing for capital gain or are you investing for income? And ultimately, I mean, look. The, the higher the return you're getting, the higher the risk, the risk. has to be. It, it, it just has to be. And and I guess you know, the, the problem isn't us as an investment opportunity. Yes. The problem is with inflation itself. Um, and I think... So I, that leads me to the sorry, to, Yeah. Where do you think this recession is going to hit? I don't think it's even started. Yeah. I, 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 I really don't. I think it's going to come in the next two months, my personal opinion. I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm I no... I think December is... The time. I'm no economist in terms of, you know, let's let's say, that, you know, t talking about the specifics of the of, of inflation and, and that kind of thing. But from a, from a recessionary perspective, I mean, listen, if we go back to... We've been talking about a recession since 2017, 2008. Probably, I can't believe you probably even more. COVID we didn't hit recession. Right? Well, well, that's that's the, I mean, that's the thing that really rings back to me. I remember that you know 2019, 2020. You know, obviously, I deal with a lot of insolvency practitioners back in the UK, and they were all complaining how they've not really been doing much work lately because no businesses are going bust, and we and we, we have a lot of these businesses, what we call zombie businesses. You know, they they just exist. They shouldn't really be there. They're yes. they're hanging on. They're getting past each month because you know either the in the, the revenue are not pushing them over for an unpaid VAT bill or an unpaid PAYE mm -hmm. bill or some new lenders come to the market mm -hmm. to lend them a bit of money to get them through another month. Mm -hmm. And these businesses are crap businesses. You know, they're not really businesses. They're, they're, they're just companies that still exist. And when COVID happened, we thought, 
that that that's it's it. going to filter that, out. That's yeah. going to sort the wheat from the chaff. Yeah. You know, the, the the fact that there's no liquidity now, the fact that there's no income yes. now, that's going to push them over. Until the government gave them blank checks. Exactly. What happened? In fact, the exact opposite. I mean, for most of these crap businesses, yeah. COVID was the most Best profitable opportunity that ever life, happened yes. to them. So, so they've they've then had another, like you say, another lease of life. It's dragging on another year, another another couple of years, and then when we came out of COVID, this, you know, the, I didn't really feel a liquidity crisis. Uh, you know, I know from me raising money from investors, there's still still plenty of those out there, and I know from other lend, you know, other lenders, they were still hap- happily dishing money out. It's only really the last six or nine months. That, it, that the liquidity really is drying up, that you know that, that um, it's harder to get loans or that loan to values have decreased. But even though all that's happened, we still haven't seen the knock-on effect of of a housing crisis, of of of, of businesses going bust, etc. I mean, I mean, yes, okay, you're starting to read more press that house prices are declining, and I'm kind of more specifically talking UK here because that's my market. But you know, house prices are declining, or, or businesses are struggling. Okay, but they're still they're still not going. But you know, they're still not going exactly. bust. You know, yes, house prices may may be declining, but no one's had a gun held to the head to sell them just yet, yes, and, yes. And, to, and to and to really realise what they are. Do so, you think a recession is a good time for you? I think I think I think it, be a correction. I think it will. Listen, for, for me, it'll be it'll be a bit of both. It'll be. It'll be tough on the business that we've already done because undoubtedly we're going to have people who are going to be slow to repay us. But because we've been planning for this and knowing that this is coming, we've been a lot more sensible on the deals that we've lent on. Mm-hmm. Um, so even if you know, even if some of our borrowers don't or can't pay us back on time, we should be comfortably asset secured. Um, so that that won't be fun, but you know that 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 is what it is. Um, the, but the other side, in terms of yes, I think there'll be I think there'll be some great opportunity out there to you know, to acquire bankrupt businesses Correct. to to Deals. to, Good to deal. take on properties. But one of the things I'm most looking forward to is is a reset in the employment market. Mm-hmm. Because you know, I mean, it is the bane of my life trying to recruit and retain decent staff who actually want to behave like a member of staff who comes to the office, and uh, you know, and, and they've got and, options and choices. Why do I have to push myself? Why exactly. To, yeah. And why do I have to smile? Why do I have to be and, <laughs> early? And there's yeah. and that and that is going to change. That yeah. I mean, we're already seeing it with with the, with the mass tech layoffs in the in in the US. Yes. Uh, and what happens in the US will happen to the UK. What happens with the tech companies will filter down to the smaller companies. But again, for me, that hasn't even re- re- really been good yet. And so, look, is it going to be in the next two months? I don't know. Like I said, I, I can't. I, I'm, the, the US is going to run out of money. The consumer. They're going to run out of gifts that the U.S. government mm-hmm. gave them by at the rate of spending by the end of this month. Right. So there'll be no free money. But the, the, With all the debts, trillions of dollars of debts. But, but, but then something always happens, doesn't it? You yeah, know, wars probably. They find it find it from somewhere else. But uh, but no. So the, how many staff do you have now in the UK? How many in staff? the finance because you've got other businesses now. Because you mentioned so in the finance, we don't, we don't have many. There's only eight or nine people in the finance wow. business. It's not. It's, it doesn't need you know need many staff. You know, I thought maybe people calling businesses. No, no. So, so most mo- most of our business comes from introducers. So we okay. so we've got a couple of sales guys who manage who manage okay. the introducers, and look, and we're not writing our, our lending book on the property side of the business is about sixty million, wow. and our lending book on the legal finance side is early early 20s, 22, 23. Wow. Um, but you know, for that for that sixty million, we might write four deals a month, five deals a month. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not we're not we're not writing. You know, it, it's hundreds not and hundreds, hundreds, of, yeah. hundreds of deals a week. You know, it, it's it's. You know, if I think about the deals I've been looking at this weekend for the, you know, it's a deal for two hundred grand. It's a deal for nine hundred grand. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's 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 lump, lumpier deals. So you're still fully hands on. Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. Didn't it worry you coming here? Leaving the business in the UK, thinking it's going to take a hit, or no, not really, because I had always, I mean, again, two answers to the question. One, I'd never been someone who was tied to my office. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd always travelled a lot, whether that was travelling around the UK for work, or whether it was living in Spain, living in France for a month here, two months there, just from a mm-hmm. lifestyle perspective. So I'd never been someone who'd been heavy, heavy in the office. Um, but that said, you know, I am the first to say that. As much as I love living in Dubai, and I do work from another country, am I as efficient? Am, am I as efficient as I would be if I was sat in the Leeds office? Of course not. You know, absolutely not. But 
Um, I think I've been learning a lot over the last year or two. You know, lots of my my misgivings in being able to recruit and retain, uh, and I've been spending a lot of effort trying to get you know trying to get the right people in the right boxes, trying to have them motivated and incentivized in the right way. But I've also kind of I'm not going to say given up, but I've kind of come to the realization that unless I am there with them every day, it's never going to be just admit eighty percent productivity or something like this. So what I'm going to do is re-recruit over here. Mm-hmm. I'm not, and to be clear, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's not the first time I'm saying this, and I know some of my staff watching listening to this that I'm not firing anyone in England yes. to replace them here. But anyone that leaves is not getting replaced in the UK. The 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 they're getting. I guess getting because the paperwork, the systems they have in place, you can manage it from here. Well, 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 because I will be here. Mm-hmm. Uh, is I, that what I, your plan is to be here all the time? Well, I am here all the time. Oh, I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I'm do forget Marbella. Still... I do the summer there. Oh, do, it's too hot here. Yeah, because it's too hot. But I mean, my 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 year runs from kind of end of September to middle of May here, mm-hmm. and then the rest of the, the summer in Marbella. And then I'll do sixty to ninety days in the UK. Yeah. Um, so you still have to pay tax. No, oh, our, our, our UK business, uh-huh. all our businesses are UK businesses that are subject to UK corporation of tax. Course. But personal uh, tax, but personal no. tax, no. It's the best thing ever, isn't it? So it it, it, it is. At least you know when your money's going here. <laughs> Yeah, true, isn't it? Uh, you decide to have private health. You know the type of hospitals you're going to go to. People go on about, um, you know, the social health and uh, and it's horrible. It's a mess in England. It, uh, yeah. I think, like, but what can we ever do about it? You know, yeah, and, and, and badly it's, managed. It, you know, what we can do is gain people listening, get new case, come to Dubai. Absolutely right. And then you see how the quality of life. Safety infrastructure. Well, I, what, what, I, what I always laugh about over here is like you know you you watch them build. I mean, they've built a country here in yeah. in about as much time as it takes them to build a roundabout in Manchester. It's true. I mean, I mean, literally, I, I had a roundabout near my house in Leeds that took about two and a half years you just to, re- to repair this roundabout because yeah. of all the bullshit that goes yeah. on. And you know, like negative people want to talk about how you know the uh, unacceptableness of let's say a dictatorship type, you know, you know yeah, whether it's one a person at the top. It's a but, good but, dictatorship. It's a good dictatorship. They're serving people and nobody Absolutely. complains. I mean, and... at the end of the day, if you know, if oh. if if uh, you know the main man here sees something and wants it done, it's it done. gets done. It's, it's, it's that simple. Yes. You know, in England, we've got. 27 chains of of local government bullshit before that then gets kicked up to the and main every one. one of them majority are losers they couldn't yeah. make it in the real they, world they, they, they couldn't, couldn't make it in the corporate world so going to the council business or government and even if they could make it they've all got their own agendas yes and 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 yeah yes. so I mean, look obviously you need you need a good person to be that dictator but as long as you know they are we blessed right now yes. because Abu Dhabi here you know that locally the generation are really giving you know, to the to the population, it's amazing. I I feel blessed. I think you're blessed. Your, your I, daughter's I, blessed. Your wife's blessed to be here at this time. I, I you know I wake up every day and say how lucky I am to be to, in Dubai. I say to my my girlfriend over here, you know, when we look at our baby, so you know she she's she's so lucky lucky to be born to be born yeah. into this. And and you know, this is just an amazing place to be. You know, it, it's clean, it's safe, it's full of opportunity. Um, you know, it, it's got it really has everything that you could want it to have. Yes. Whatever that may be. You know, where, if you're in business. If if you want to party, if you want to eat great food, if you want to, if you want to see culture, and you know, again, the the negative people in England go, oh, well, where's the Yorkshire countryside? Of course, there's no fucking Yorkshire countryside, exactly. right? But but you know, once you uh, once you step outside the the kind of square square bit of of Dubai and all the sky rises, yes. the you know the beauty. Of you know the places you can go to hike and explore, yes. you know your your hatters yes. and or, or, I mean yes. I don't know all the different names, but I mean there's so so much uh, great stuff to look at here and great culture. It's just, just the way you. It's see just life. different. It's just different yeah. culture. Yeah, it's celebrated here. Mm. I think in England when I had fancy cars, I used to get keyed. Here they take a photograph. Yeah, they get inspired by it. So you you got a boat. I've got a boat. The sea squirter. So what is that? I'm not. I'm, I used to have a boat in Thailand. Oh really? I used to have a place in Thailand. So what's the size of this boat? Because so, you kindly sent me an invitation. I don't know if I, you ever recall. Yeah, I do. I, I just do could, I, maybe I was away and I couldn't attend. And then you 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 never asked me again. <laughs> well, uh, you know what? I, I've been out of town, but we've got another dinner this Friday night. So if, you, if you're free Friday, Friday night, yeah. F- ah, Saturday? No, but <laughs> next week we'll do. You okay, can come I'm next going week. to China oh, really? the week after. I'm going to take in my. I I went to Paris with my nine year old. 
and the bonding time we had was incredible. And he's really into history. Okay. So I'm taking to the Great Wall of China, the oh, Temple of the for one week. But this Friday, I never go out. This freaking Friday, my son's friend's dad has invited us. Oh, really? Only yesterday, well, well, I would look, have come. I'm back in town. So now, tell so me about this boat. I mean, so look, I've, I've always so you, been, like, you, you like the water. I've, I've always liked boats. Uh, I've, uh, you know, over the years, I've, I've chartered a couple of times. I've been a sharer on somebody else's boat before. Um, and I got the opportunity to buy this one again during COVID and I just chartered you know, for the summer or two before and I, and I didn't know where COVID was going uh, and I thought you know what if I buy a boat I've got a I've got it to kind of live on and have fun with but we can move around depending on what's going on because if you remember back to to let's say the summer of yeah the summer of 2020 Congrats. and also going into 21 different European countries would have different rules at different times. Yes. Spain was on lockdown, yes. but then France wasn't. France correct. was doing this, but, you know, whatever, Italy wasn't. Italy, yeah, correct. And I thought, well, if I can have the boat, then, first of all, if anything happens in France, we'll just sail across to Spain or to Italy or to wherever mm -hmm. it may be. And worst case, if everyone goes on shutdown, well, I've got my own, own little floating palace. So that's that's kind of that's kind of why I bought it. But I also thought it was, it, you know, I needed to pay for itself in some yes. way, so I was always going to use it as a as a marketing tool, as a, as a as a as a corporate entertaining tool, and that's what we did for a couple of years. Did you live on it, so we used to before Marbella. We 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 lived the last couple of summers on it. Amazing, um, like three and a half months or something. But then last year we bought bought the place in Marbella, and at the same time as buying that, Elena got pregnant. And she, well, I think for multiple reasons, we were killing each other, you know, living on the boat by the end of the summer. She also, being pregnant, didn't want to live on the boat the next summer because you know, she, she, she knew we'd have a baby. Uh, and I kind of agreed. I, I, so I put it up for sale because I thought, you know what, even if I go and do a couple of boys trips on my own, what we're going to do justified, two weeks, three weeks? Yeah. I can't. I can't justify having it for for you know for for three weeks use or something. So I put it up for sale in France. Didn't get didn't get any interest. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of boats on the market in Europe. But you bought it in Dubai, no? You bought it? No, in no. Europe? But bought, oh, really? bought 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 it. In, bought, it was it came from Italy, but I bought so I bought oh. it in France. Kept oh. it in France. Put it back up for sale. Didn't get any interest. And I thought, look, I'm not desperate. I'm not going to slash the price in half or something. Um, but then I thought, what I'll do is I'll move it to Dubai, because if if it's going to be for sale, I may as well sell it in Dubai. Correct. Um, Potentially, markets better. Well, I, th I did think that you know there's less less European boats here, so you know hopefully mm -hmm. the price will be the same, if not better. Mm -hmm. And I thought well, at least we'll get to use it as well in yes. the meantime yes. while it's up for sale. So I moved it to Dubai. Uh, it came here last January. Well, th this January, right? yeah, lose track of time. By sea? No, it comes on the back of a shipping container, okay. so okay. not 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 a cheap affair. Uh, but I thought what it cost me, I'll probably get added onto the capital value here. Anyway, to us, it's moved here since uh, it took about three and a half weeks or something to arrive. And since the day it's arrived, I've never even bothered sticking up for sale because I've had use I've it. had so much use from it. And it's, it's a very different kind of use in Dubai than, you know, yachting is very different here to how, to how it is in Europe. So, you know, in Europe, it's kind of very much full weeks, sleepovers, to to exploring. Yes. Whereas in Dubai... A few hours in the water and come back. Yeah, you know, whereas over here... Like you say, four hours here, two yes. hours there. Yeah. So I've really used it as a as an entertaining marketing, you know, kind of corporate tool. Yes, obviously I have fun on it myself with my friends. You know, Elena uses it with her friends or we hang out with the baby or whatever. But, you know, like we just talked about the dinner, at least once a week I host a dinner for 10 or 12 people. Wow. I'm coming. Definitely coming. <laughs> Do it. Just have to get the dates. You know, clients of mine, I just, you know, because I don't charter it. I don't take mm -hmm. charter money. Sure. But, you know, clients of mine, I give I give it to them to, you know, to, to, to use. Yes. And, um, and uh, you know, I guess just... But you know, build build value, build marketing, kudos, etc. So that, I mean, the boat gets used four or five times a week. Do you have a captain, full time captain? Three, stuff? three, three full time crew. Yeah, good God. So it costs crew. you a fortune. Right? It, it, it's they're very expensive, mm. and there's no you know, uh, you know, boat owners have always got ways of convincing themselves how they get to do it cheaper than someone else. That's bullshit. There is no cheap Cost way to, to run a boat. But my two, let's say, justifications are one is business. enjoyment, but secondly is business and. There's no way that I don't make it pay for itself, mm -hmm. you know, with, with with the people that I entertain on board. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, if someone wants to be negative, they'll say, "Well, you don't have to take people. Like you could take them for dinner in a restaurant." Or something. Or, uh, it's a it's a completely different thing. Listen, if if I if I 
like I've been messaging some people today, people who I don't know, reaching out to them because I'd, I'd like to have dinner with them. When I invite them to a restaurant for dinner, any person who, let's say, is going to be of real value to me, who I've never met and never spoken to, they're not going to accept a random invitation to, to, you know, to, to a dinner with me. If I it's in a local restaurant, which they could go to themselves Any anyway, time. when I invite them on the boat, all of a sudden it's a completely it's, mm, it's, it's a true. completely it's different true. framing. You know, first it's about everybody seems to like boats, so they want to do that. Secondly, you know, and I don't say this in an arrogant way, but it, I come with the framing and curious of a guy who owns a boat, so mm, you must know, be done well. Must, for must be something worth talking to me about. When they then come to the boat, all of a sudden, you know, I. I control the night because yeah. you're you're on you're on my boat. And there's the, no distractions. This exactly. Is it, yeah. So you know, for the I mean, we started these dinners back in February in February last year, and before I left for the summer, we probably did about fourteen weeks of it, wow. where you know, bum bum bum, week after week, where we and have Dubai between, is all about networking, connecting. I probably had ten to twelve people at dinner a week for those 14 weeks. You know, that's what, 150, 160 people that I, got, that I got to spend time with. And I'm not saying that I transact with every one of those people every week. And that's, that's not the intention because that's not really how I and look at my network. Either, yeah. you know, I, I kind of build long-term valuable ne- uh, mm-hmm. relationships, but there's no way, no way that, you know, just one deal or two deals out of those people, mm-hmm. whether it comes this year, next year, whatever, isn't going to pay for it, you know, two, three times over. So, um, so yes, you know, if someone can look at, listen to this story now, so he's just justifying it to himself to make himself feel better. Absolutely not. You know. <laughs> and you know what? So what? So what are you just serving you? Makes <laughs> you happy, that's right? the, Listen, yes, W- would I, even if I didn't make a penny out of it, or if I couldn't offset a penny, would I have it? Probably would, but it's it is an absolute black and white fact yes. that that the way I get to use it from yes. a from a marketing and networking perspective it's working for you. is is absolutely. I, I like cars, and okay. you know I'm the most boring, fast car driver. I go from my house, Emirates Golf Club, to the Emirates Mall and back. That's it. I don't do track anything, but you know it makes me feel good when I see it. As a business owner, not many people come and say, well done to you, do they? Yeah, you just have to say, well Absolutely. done to yourself and motivate yourself. So you've gone into the podcast route now. You, you're kind of why and are you trying to inspire people, share your story? What, what's going on? You know, so I started the podcast about five years ago. Um, and I and it, my original reason was because obviously when I went bankrupt back in two thousand and eight, I had a lot of uh, negative Google from back then. Was not a lot, but I had some negative Google. Yeah. Um, but because there'd been nothing new on Google, even in two thousand and sixteen, two thousand and seventeen, if you Google me, um, it still taught you. Find if had, had some smellies from kind of two thousand and eight. Which was becoming a bit of a problem for me in you know work, working in financial services. You know, I'd go to let's say a, a bank meeting, someone who, who I didn't know would be getting on good. After the meeting, they Google me, and all of a sudden they wouldn't take my call anymore. So this is what we discussed before. Yeah, the interview that I had this in two thousand and nine. Incredible, and you don't know where it's coming from. Absolutely, you don't know where it's coming from. Yeah, and it shocks you every time. So I needed to do something to improve that um, position. So what, obviously at the time I had some PR guys that I'd work with and we'd create new content, you know, we'd put out whatever, you know, press releases or, you know, try and get, you know, coverage in newspapers. Mm -hmm. But one of the best ways, and, you know, this is obviously, you know, tip for anyone listening who wants some online presence, one of the best ways to, uh, we'll start to get some online presence is to use all the different social media channels because they're all such high authority sites that if you've got a presence on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, it's Facebook, Facebook okay, so the these are all page ones of Google. Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden, you know, if you Google Matt Haycox, then I've then five or six of the first page of Google is already yes. taken up by these things. Yes. And so I created all these and YouTube, you know, so I created all of these profiles that I needed some content to put on there. So the podcast originally came just purely by accident as being some content to go online just to just to pad out my presence. So I had new content to push away the old content. Yes. And the podcast was a, let's say, an easy route for repurposing because I could sit down and record a video interview like this and then chop it up into shorts for Instagram, exactly. audio for 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 um for Spotify or whatever. That's why I started. 
Um, but then as time went, and, and it was nothing more, you know, structured or complicated than that. But then as time went on, I was doing the podcast. It, and I guess it, let's say, accidentally got traction. I started to realize uh, what a valuable tool having a podcast was. Again, from a framing perspective, that, you know, when now when you do Google me, it's not just that, it's not just that, you can't see the bad stuff anymore. You can only see the good stuff. You see Matt Haycox, who oh, I didn't know him before, but he's done 350 podcast episodes. And he's, Is that how many you've done now? I must build something like that oh. now, yeah. And he's sat so you're there. prolific. We've had a weekly show for most of the last five years. Well, and I never got invited. Thanks. You're about to. You're about to. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a story to tell, man. Yeah. Amazing. Um, but no, I've always, well, recorded, always recorded so in I, England. You know... One, I honor you because you're fearless, you you share your vulnerability and you are who you are. I love that, yes? And people can criticize, I feel the same. And people say it resonates with me because you're honest, you're truth. I share my good points, bad points, strengths, weaknesses. And I think that's the strength. And you've been, I think through our conversation, I realized you're actually very consistent. You're doing these weekly networking events on the boat. You consistently for the last five years, you've been in business. You need to be consistent, right? I mean, I, I, I was talking about this on a, a post or something I'd done the other day. And that I really believe with whatever business or whatever it is you want to achieve, with a plan, with consistency and with volume, mm. You can't you can't fail to be successful. Yes. I mean, you just can't fail to be successful. You know, the the, the plan obviously the, there needs to be some strategy of how you're going to get from A to B. You know, whatever that is, whether you it's being a sales closer, whether it's you know whether it's being a business owner, whether it's trying to be a football player or a tennis player. Okay, there's got to be a strategy of how you're going to get from A to Z. If you've got that strategy, and you apply it every single day, mm -hmm. and you apply it at volume. You, you just think. can't fail. Absolutely. Now, does that mean that you're going to be David Beckham if, if it was football you were trying to do? No, okay. It it's doesn't just mean a matter of talent but, involved. But it means yeah. that you're going to be ahead of 99% of the rest of yes. the market. Does it mean that you're going to be Elon Musk and a super billionaire? No, mm -hmm. it doesn't. But can, does it definitely mean you're going to be making hundreds of thousands, if not millions of pounds? Absolutely. absolutely. I mean, you know, you, you, just, you just can't fail in anything if you do the work. I agree. I agree. Man, we've been an hour and 40 minutes. Can you oh, believe really? it? I've enjoyed every second, man. I really have enjoyed it. Thank you for that. Well, thank you for having me. Um, two years. Yeah. We're going to sit here two years. What What are you doing in two years' time? Different businesses? Are you established in Dubai? Do you have businesses in Dubai? Where do you see yourself in two years? Um, hopefully still in Dubai. Uh, by, by hopefully, what I mean is... As long as I'm happy here, then hopefully, uh, I think people overcomplicate moving to other countries. And you know, when I left England, that you know, a lot of people who knew me in England were like, "Oh my God, what are you going to do? What if you don't like it? Well, if I don't like it, I'll come Ooh, back." Yeah. You know, it's it's not very difficult. But uh, I can't ever see myself going to England again. But for now, I can't see why I'd ever be leaving Dubai for all the reasons we just said about opportunity. So yeah, definitely established here. Um, definitely having a bigger office and a bigger presence here. Am I going to be doing local work in Dubai? I don't know. I think that for, for me, I, the reason I, everything I do, I do in the UK is because I know the UK, you know I know it inside out. It's actually out. a big market, 60 million people in a small island. Well, uh, the UK, yeah. yeah it's a big market population-wise. It's more, And you can go from one end of the country to another in three and a half hours, right? And also, you know, aside from the size of it, you know, from a, let's say, a, a legality perspective, a regulatory you know perspective, I know, I know it inside out. So I think for me... I, I, Yes, the work I'm doing in Dubai is kind of, let's say, the bits of the best of both worlds. That I'm employing some staff here mm -hmm. who will just be good staff mm -hmm. who I can manage because I'm next mm -hmm. to them and they work on my UK stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing some fundraising over here because you know the the regulatory climate and the and the appetite, both with financial advisors and yes. with the end user customer, is is much more conducive to getting things done here. I mean, in in the UK, you know, we we kind of regulate ourselves out of doing business. I mean, you know, dealing with the FCA and the UK is just utterly unbearable. Um, so I think yeah, def definitely building a more of a presence here, uh, not giving up or changing anything in the UK. Um, and yeah, um, I think if you if you ask me what problem would I have liked to have solved by then, I would like to hope I've gotten better at recruiting and retaining. You know, that's, uh, that's really, you know really what people never surprise you. And I, I've been how long? I've been in business forty years. People, 
they never cease to surprise mm. me. There's always something new, something different. I think you've got, you've, you know what, you've got to accept that you'll you'll continue to be disappointed. Yes. Um, but I think also you, but you have to accept that if you want to grow, you need you, you, you need people. You, need you know, I mean, I get I get a lot of you know people who reach out to me for advice. So I, I want to grow, but I don't want to hire any people. So well, you, it's just you can't grow. Only so much I mean, time in a day. What can you, you do? know? Yes, okay. You might subscribe to the smallest beautiful theory. Yes, you might be able to do some work and sell your uh, at home and make a bit of money. But show me a billionaire who hasn't got staff and yes. works from home. <laughs> it's just Elon it's Musk, just one not one possible. His, one of his key strengths is recruitment. Who's who is Elon Musk? Right, recruiting the right people because he's not sending rockets to the air and building Tesla cars. He's going to write people in the right yeah. place. Same with um, Steve Jobs, hire the right people. Yeah, amazing. Finally, mm. you you actually you're a philanthropist. I noticed a beautiful story about a young boy that you raised money for. Could you share with that? Because it honestly broke my heart yeah. when I was watching him. And by the way, the way you've written your website, and we're going to put your website details sure. everything on. I love it. It's really heartfelt. It's from the heart, isn't it? The way you've written it is from the heart. Absolutely. I mean, it was it was a, a complete, I guess, a complete ac accidental story that, uh, you know, I guess got me emotionally attached to it. And uh, I mean, a few years ago, I mean, I forget now, it must be 2018, something like that. Um, I was, I'd just been financing Hartlepool Football Club back in the UK. And I'd gone up to watch a match there uh, one afternoon. And I'd, um, I was on my own, I hadn't, hadn't gone with anyone else. And I was killing time during the, in the director's box at, um, at half time. And when I say director's box, I mean, in Hartlepool's director's <laughs> box isn't, isn't exactly it's a what, box. <laughs> you, what you get at Chelsea. It was basically a, a floor with, uh, you know, with some diet cokes and chicken legs in there and every, you know, a, a, probably a hundred people milling around. And I saw this, uh, I saw this young guy um, sat in a wheelchair with two or three people around him, and they were all wearing T-shirts that said uh, "Help Alfie Walk." And I, like I said, I, I didn't know who they were. I'm assuming it's Alfie in the wheelchair, and I'm yes. assuming the other people are his, his family members. I thought, you know, I've got some time to kill. I'll, uh, I'll go and have a chat with them, see what they're up to, and uh, and you know, give him give him some money for uh, wh whatever the issue is. So I met him, started to talk to his talk to his mom. It was his mom and his auntie who were there, and they were explaining that he he got cerebral palsy, and he uh, he was trying to raise fifty thousand pounds for a, a life changing operation that was not available on the NHS. Mm -hmm. uh, it was doable in in the states at the time, but they had a, a doctor in the UK who could do it, but you, but you had to pay for it, and they needed fifty grand. And they were telling me that they'd been fundraising for about eighteen months, and this was in November. Couldn't raise fifty thousand. Well, listen. The story gets the story gets worse. So, so they've been telling me they've been fundraising for about eighteen months, um, and they needed to um, have all the money by February. This was November. Otherwise, his body would have degenerated too much to be able to accept the operation. So I'm listening to this story, and in my head, I'm thinking, well, they've been raising this money for whatever 15, 18 months. There's only a couple of months left. If you do the maths, they must have raised 45 of this 50 grand, <laughs> wasn't they? So I'm thinking, you know what? I'll put five grand I'm, in I'm, I'm going to give him the balance today and uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm make, make his day. So I said, so I've played all this out in my head. I said, how much have you raised so far? She said, 1,600 pounds. <laughs> I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I said, listen, let me be totally honest with you. I said, this is not good. I said, I was going to, I was going to give you the balance of your money because I've played this maths out in my head. I said, I've just met you. I said, I can't give you 48 grand. <laughs> I says, but I really want to do something to help. I said, so I'll tell you what. I said, I'm going to go pound for pound with you. And I want you to go away now and raise money between now and a specific point in time. And I will, I will double whatever you do. So I said, it's something special for me, but it gives you some some drive Incentive, some drive yeah. to go and do your own bit. So they said, oh, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, what's the date? What's the end date? And this was like the middle of November or something. I said, I'll tell you what, let's call it Christmas Day. Because... A, it's not five or six yeah, weeks. Yeah, they've got to book it because they're going in February. But, and stuff but then it's Christmas. It's Christmas Day. It's a yeah. special day. It'll be fun. So they took a picture of me. They said, can you have your picture with Alfie? Which they did. Uh, and it ends up going in the paper. So because it's gone in the paper, they've then started to get a bit of traction and gone and done some fundraising. So we kept loosely in touch. 
didn't really think too much more of it. I get a phone call on Christmas Day. He's like, Matt, Matt it's, it's Alfie. I said, oh, Alfie. He goes, I've got good news for you. He says, what? He goes, we've raised 16 grand. Oh, so, fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> so it might be good news. It might be good news for you, buddy. <laughs> yeah. oh, so, I ended, nice. so I ended up obviously matching, put, put, matching that, but they were still a bit short. So I then ended up putting some more in. Um, and they got the operation, and he uh, and, and you he build a friendship with b- b- built a relationship with the family. But I, the the reason that then span that was just me doing that personally. There was no charity at the time. The reason it spanned into a charity was because I enjoyed doing it, uh, and I and I thought we can solve a few problems here. For, for, first of all, there's obviously people like this who are in need who need need the capital, but it's not just the money they need. Invariably, the people who are in this position also don't have the other well, knowledge that around them to help with the problem so if you take Alfie and his family you know once he got the money they were ringing me asking me questions like well we need to go and stay in this town while we're having the operation how do we book a hotel how do we do like like you know yeah, the, no the, clue, the, the, yes. they don't you know un- understand the uh, un- understand the basics so I thought well I can provide capital and I can provide uh, knowledge. You know, knowledge support and infrastructure and I thought how are we going to do it well if we create a charity uh, I thought I've got a good network of people I can tap into to you know to, to get them to put money. I thought we all, if we're honest about it, we all hate these charity dinners that we go to. We get dragged down to them because we're you know we're doing a friend a favour, but they're always shit. You know it's a it's a crap venue, it's terrible food, uh, and the the event itself's crap as well. But we just do it out of obligation to the person that we want to that we want to be with, so that we want to support. So I thought, well, I will create two or three great events a year events okay i'm going to pull in some favors to get people in the beginning but i'm going to make the events so good that people want to go so that it'll be self-sustaining events and then we'll the, the money that we'll deploy we're going to give it to cases where we can get emotionally involved and it's look it's always a hard one with charities because so many everyone's got their own view yes. on what's important yes. or not but for me i can only get emotionally attached to something i can get emotionally attached to yes. so when someone says oh can you put this money into curing malaria in Africa or curing AIDS or something I'm not that that is a very I'm sure they need very it but you're not emotionally it, attached to that of course yeah but what I can see is you know the kid down the street who has a debilitating heart condition that's going to you know kill her in a year's time yes. I can get very emotionally attached yes. to that and, and I can yes. support it so basically we said let's create a charity we'll raise money two or three events a year and we said let's try and raise 100 grand a year and deploy it onto cases that we can get emotionally attached with and that's what we've been doing for the last five or six years so and you've um, been hitting target every time Hitting target. Listen, COVID wasn't wasn't obviously great for putting events on, uh, and obviously now I'm not in the UK. Um, we, we've done a bit challenges. less there, but I'm going to. But I'll still deploy it in the UK because again, that's where my network is. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to hopefully in February of this year do a, do an event here in Dubai. Uh, I think you know probably a bit easier to raise money Amazing. here as well. So, um, so yeah, Alfie didn't make it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's alive with us. The way you've written it, it's like it wasn't his time or something. I I read it, I was like, no, no, Alfie's not with us anymore. He is with us. Oh my God, I had a tear this morning. Very much with us. Congratulations. uh, His operation was successful. It was was his legs that were the issue. You know, he he wasn't. Cerebral palsy. I thought maybe his body deteriorated or something. No, no, no. The operation worked well. I have to reread it. I am dyslexic. I was reading, I was like, oh no, we lost Alfie. You you, you make me want to go and reread it now to make sure I'll do a screenshot. Maybe it was me. 99% me. Congratulations, man. Thank you. I truly honor you and thank you for coming. And we've got to do this again. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks what we're going to do me. next time, now I know your story, we're going to talk about nuggets, if that's okay. Absolutely. In business, helping others to, to you know, share stories. Let's do it. You know, as entrepreneurs, we put our head on the chopping block, don't we? So it's what people think, you know, why is it always happened to yourself? But because I choose that life, mm-hmm. right? If you want an eventless life, become an employee. Don't you see it that way? Well, I think I think even if you're an employee, you're gonna you, 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 your head's on the chopping block in a different way. It's just yeah, it's, it's, it's just, somebody, it's somebody else's control. Yeah. yeah, mate, I honour you. Thank you. I salute you, Gladys. <laughs> Thank you so much, man. Thanks for having me. Nearly two hours. It's gone like that. Really enjoyed it. Thank you again, Gladys. As well, honour to have you here, man. Thank you.